It does. It does. Look at that. Oh, man. I like your tie, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> after I saw what Jeff Durbin was wearing yesterday, I, I threw out all my ties. They're just gone. Uh, figured if he can do that, uh, why, do, why, am I, why am I closing off my airway? <clears throat> oh, he's not even in here to hear that. What a bummer. Yeah. Well, he's probably heard it out there somewhere, so that's, that's pretty good. All right, I actually have an extra minute. That's really, oh, that's gone. All right. <clears throat> As I considered uh, the assignment of uh, the topic, I'll have to admit that it would have been a little easier to, to switch my uh, tomorrow evening with this. Uh, at least for logical reasons, as far as the order of subjects, because when you, when you talk about works righteousness groups, what you're talking about is the negation of justification by faith, which is my subject for uh, the closing session uh, tomorrow uh, afternoon. And so, um, in, in essence, I'm, I'm going to have to sort of assume <clears throat> what I'm going to be saying tomorrow evening. So uh, please do not fault me for not spending too much time establishing what I will establish uh, tomorrow afternoon uh, when I focus upon a positive case for justification by faith in a, uh, in a fashion hopefully that you will, uh, you will be able to utilize. Uh, I'm assuming that on the street, as in the situations I have faced, for example, when street preaching in London or something like that and talking to Muslims, uh, there, you already know the necessity of apologetics because you're dealing with people in a context where they're going to be much more likely to raise objections to what you're saying uh, than they might if you're speaking in a church or, or something along those lines. And so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at uh, the positive stuff, and today we'll look at the apologetic aspect of responding to works righteousness systems. Now, there's two ways of doing that. Uh, I could sit here and, and go through all of these various groups that have uh, a different take on works righteousness. Or, I think in a much more useful fashion, uh, I can focus upon what the scriptures say when they specifically speak against the most uh, virulent forms of works righteousness that were uh, around in the Apostles' day, and then build upon that in my experience, uh, especially in doing apologetics, I know when I first started studying Mormonism, I was very, very concerned because I was learning all this stuff and there was just, there was just so much, I, I, I just didn't figure I could ever remember all of it. And what I eventually learned is that the best way, and this all goes back to the old, good old Walter Martin, used to tell the story about how the fact that they would, they would train, and you've heard this story before, but it's, it's really applicable here, they would train bank tellers uh, to detect frauds, not by showing them a bunch of fraudulent money, but the way you train a bank teller to recognize frauds is by making them intimately familiar with the real thing. You spend your time studying real currency so that when you see the fake, uh, it, it pops out at you. And the same thing is true here. We could spend all of our time talking about, well, this group has this view and that group has that view. But in my opinion, the best way to be prepared to deal with a works righteousness system is to know so well what the scripture says about that subject in the context that it addresses it, that you can then make application no matter what the variant is that ends up being presented to you. And so knowing the truth is the most important element here. And to, to do that, there's just no place that you can go like Paul's epistle to the Galatians. Uh, if you know this epistle, if you know its background, if you know what uh, is going on in it, then not only will you have the foundation upon which to reason with someone who clearly is trusting in their own goodness or thinking that the religious activities that they've engaged in or somehow uh, have put God in their debt, uh, that this somehow is, is good enough to stand before a holy God, you'll be able to reason with those folks. And in my experience, when, when you know a, a section of Scripture really well, when, when you can communicate to someone in such a way that they can tell, you know, this person isn't just uh, looking at a, at a list of verses in the back of their Bible and quoting a few to me. This is someone who has actually dealt with this subject. They've thought about this. They've, they've really put some effort into it. It helps to communicate. It helps to 
uh, allow people to really listen to what you're saying. So I would highly recommend to you the study of the book of Galatians. Let's look at the first chapter. Uh, a few things just in passing. I do not believe uh, that there is any other text in the New Testament that contains rougher language than Paul's epistle to the Galatians. You might be able to raise the specter of Matthew chapter 23 when Jesus went after the scribes and Pharisees. But I don't even think that in, in Jesus' uh, words you will find the level of fervor that you will find in Paul's writing. Now, he may have actually written this letter himself. There's, it's possible that you could interpret that one verse toward the end of the epistle, see what a large, in what large letters I'm writing to you, either a large letter or it's a large letter, but I'm writing to you. There's no mention of an amanuensis. And one thing is awfully sure. Uh, if you read the original language and you read Ephesians, and then you read Galatians, there's a major difference between the two. It's the same person writing, but Galatians is choppy. Very frequently, the verb will be left out. Um, it, is, it is written in the, in the heat of passion. Uh, we need to remember, as, as Peter said, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, but it was still men speaking. What ends up being written is exactly what God wanted, but the fact of the matter is, Paul very clearly was extremely passionate about what he was writing here. Extremely passionate. That's why you only have five, a five-verse introduction. You don't have any, oh, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, all the rest of that stuff. You got a five-verse introduction, and then you've got a right cross. That's what you've got. Look at beginning of verse 6. I am amazed that you are so quickly being removed from the one who called you by the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. So, so there is no political correctness here. There is no attempt to soften the blow. You must remember that the apostle knew that this letter was going to be read in the churches. This is to, a, this is to be distributed around the churches in an entire area of Galatia. And so he knew that the very men that he is about to anathematize, the very men that he's going to say by the end of the letter, I wish they'd let the knife slip, they have been separated from Christ, they have fallen from grace, those very men are not only going to be sitting in the congregation, some of them are going to be in leadership in the congregation when this letter is read. He knows the hand grenade that he is rolling into the front door of these churches. He's well aware of it, and he does not do this lightly. None of us should ever roll a theological hand grenade to the front door of a church lightly. And Paul does not do so here. But he says, I am amazed how quickly you're being removed. And notice, it's from the one who called you by the grace of Christ. Theological defection <clears throat> is not merely matter of, a matter of differing opinions. When it comes to the gospel, it's the difference between relationship with God and rejecting a relationship with God. This isn't just, he's not talking here about just, well, they have their view and we have our view. This is about the gospel. And he says, you, you are so quickly being removed from the one who called you by the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is not another. And there he uses the two terms, heteros and alos, to say it's another gospel of a different kind. It's not a gospel of the same kind. Now, don't, no, no, we, have to, we have to walk a line here. We have, as I've experienced as I've gotten older, so much of the Christian life is balance. Not constantly falling off one side or the other, being blown about by every wind of doctrine, finding that, that proper balancing point. And so I know, on the one hand, we have the people who think that Paul is completely out of line here. When I debated Barry Lynn, he, he, his description of, of Paul's epistle to Galatians was he was over the top. He was over the top, uh, out of line. So you've got those people that could never understand this because they don't believe that we can really know what the gospel is, and your gospel is as good as anybody else's gospel. And so you've got that indifference over there in liberalism and in so much of evangelicalism today. But over here on the other side, sometimes we get the ugly folks that basically say, unless you form 
every letter the way I form letters, the, dot every I and cross every T and say everything the way I say it down to the smallest detail, then you are not truly a believer. And that is ugly. It gets extremely ugly. It ends up being the church of one. Uh, you draw the circle so small you have to stand on one foot just to stay within the circle. You're the only one that can make it. And we don't want either one. Now, the biggest danger today is obviously we don't know what the gospel is, and all gospels are equal, and all the rest of that stuff, and that's what Paul's writing against here. But we can never go the other direction, uh, so much so that we make our particular interpretation of everything the, the, the standard for everybody else. Whatever they're being moved to is not another gospel of the same kind. It is a different gospel. And he says, except there, there are those who desire to trouble you. They have a desire to trouble you. And, and they wish to pervert, to twist, to change the gospel of Christ. And that term that is used there, metastrepsi, it can mean to just twist something completely out of shape. But it can be to just twist something just enough to where it becomes non-functional. You know, uh, I, I've, got a, I've got a storage room out back, and when it gets really humid, the door swells, and it's got two locks on it. If I dare lock the upper lock, I'm doomed. I'll never get into that thing. And I've had to take the, the key out there and take a, a, uh, uh, a wrench and, and turn that to get that lock open. And I know someday it's just going to go... Pfft, and that, that key is going to be gone. But I'm, I'm already noticing the key is starting to, starting to bend just a little bit. These people want to just bend the gospel just enough to make it another gospel. So what we can learn from this is there is a way of making something look as, as close as possible to the real gospel while it changes its, its essence enough so it is not a gospel of the same kind, but a gospel of a different kind. And that's the most dangerous thing that we face. Because, you see, most false teachers do not come waltzing into the church wearing a clown suit and bozo hair and a big old nose and say, hi, I'm here to de deceive you. They look like us, they speak like us, they talk like us, and they come, come amongst us, and they seek to draw disciples after themselves. And they want, they've got, to, they've got to twist the message some, some way or they're not going to have something to grab you with, but they want to do it as, as little as possible so they don't draw attention to themselves. And so these are individ individuals who want, to, who want to twist the gospel of Christ. And then Paul says, but even if we are an angel from heaven, proclaim a gospel to you other than the gospel which we have proclaimed to you, Anathema esto. Let him be anathema. That's not man's curse. That's God's curse. As we said before, so say I now again, if anyone proclaims the gospel to you of that which we have proclaimed to you, which you have received, I'm sorry, let him be anathema. And so Paul begins, I mean, this is the opening of the epistle. This is the opening of the letter, a proclamation of God's judgment upon a certain people who claim to be Christians. They claim to be believers. They're going to be in the church that is reading these letters. Now notice chapter 2. In chapter 2, he is, begins discussing even Titus, who is with me, didn't, that we didn't, he didn't have to be circumcised, verse 4. But it was because of Pseudadelphoi. Pseudadelphoi, false brothers. There are entire denominations today that would never, ever, ever use that term because they no longer have confidence enough in knowing what the gospel is to be able to identify anyone as a false brother. If your confidence in the Word of God and your confidence in its clarity and your confidence in its preservation, your confidence in its perspicuity is so small that you can't even think of somebody who's a false brother, you have missed the boat. Because Paul can speak of false brethren who had snuck in to the fellowship. Now, what does it mean to call someone a false brother? Well, again, it's not something you should be doing on a regular basis. I mean, if that's the first words out of your mouth, 
again, you're probably in the one-foot church. Uh, you're you're going to be pretty alone before long. But there has to be a time when someone is identified as a false brother, and that's what's going on here. And very clearly, to even use this terminology, and to use the, the twice, he talks about sneaking in, secretly brought in, they, they snuck in. What he's saying is, they're in the fellowship. They're amongst us. But they shouldn't be. And they know they shouldn't be. And it's their intention to cause difficulty, because he says, they, they, it was because of these, these, these snuck-in false brethren who had, who had come in to spy out the freedom which we have in Christ Jesus. He's using spy language. He's using military language, and then they have a reason for it. They, they want to see what we're saying about the freedom we have in Christ Jesus, but they have a reason, because there's a Hina clause there at the end, in order that they might bring us into bondage might bring us into slavery. Oh, Paul, how, I don't know how any church ever got along with you around because you were just so judgmental. I mean, here you are thinking that you can say that these people, don't you realize we're all just doing the best we can? And you know, we're, we're, they just love Jesus. Look, I mean, look at all the things they've suffered. They, 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 you're telling me that people who love Jesus are false brethren, and they want to bring us into bondage. And, oh, Paul, you'll just split churches right and left, won't you? Isn't that the, the, the spirit of the modern age? That is the very essence of how our modern age thinks. But Paul identifies these as false brethren. And he had says that we as Christians have freedom... We have freedom in Christ Jesus. And there are going to be those who are going to want to take that freedom from us. And what are they going to promise us in exchange for that freedom? All sorts of things. Might be heaven. Might be spiritual authority over others. Might be certainty. Oh, you don't want to be part of all those Protestant churches. They believe in sola scriptura. Here, across the Tiber River, we'll give you the 2,000-year-old church, and we'll give you certainty in what you're to believe. Yeah, the serpent has been hissing for a long time. In order that they might bring us into bondage, but notice what Paul says. We did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour. For a small moment of time, we did not yield in subjection to them in order that the truth of the gospel might abide or remain with you. Why is Paul so fervent here? Why is he, is he bearing his, his soul? Why does he speak with such harsh language? Because he realizes what is really at stake is, in fact, the very truth of the gospel. Now, folks, if you are going to walk in the apostolic shoes, so to speak, if you are going to have the kind of passion that Paul did, please make sure that whatever the issue is really is relevant to the truth of the gospel. Because when we go after somebody on a side issue, on something else, as if it is the very truth of the gospel, we end up diluting true concern about the real issues that do define the gospel. And that is, that's one of the reasons that a lot of people in the modern church are afraid of this attitude exemplified by the apostle because they've seen it abused so many times. I mean, let's be honest. On almost every side of the eschatology issue, you'll have some people who will say, this is the issue, and if you don't agree with me on this, I mean, you just, I mean, there's just so many ramifications, and you can't possibly believe this, and you can't possibly believe that, and, and they just, just, you know, go insane about it. And the result is that a lot of people just want to stand back and go, I, you know, I, I, I I don't want to go there. I, I don't want to be that kind of person. And the result is, when you come to real issues that do define the gospel, they still have the same attitude. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. 
and the sheep suffer as a result. So if you're going to follow apostolic example, uh, make sure that you're focused upon the same things that the apostles were, and that is the truth of the gospel. So we did not allow ourselves to be subjected to them for even an hour in order that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. There are issues that are absolute hills to die on. They are there. And the truth of the gospel most definitely is one of those issues. Look down toward the end of that chapter because there you have the encounter between Peter and Paul. And you have the indication that normally defection from the gospel toward a works righteousness system does not happen overnight. It is something that is done slowly. Peter had seen the visions. Peter had been told, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Do not consider anything, Don't, do not call anything unclean what I have called clean. And yet tradition can be such a powerful, long-lasting force that when men come from James at Jerusalem, even though Peter had eaten in table fellowship with the Gentiles, he withdrew, and now you had the Gentile table, and you had the Jewish table, and you had the danger of a Gentile church and a Jewish church. And Paul realizes that they are not walking straight in accordance with the truth of the gospel. They have, even Peter has varied from the path that is defined by the truth of the gospel itself. The term is orthopodeo, to walk straight in accordance with the rule. That's where we get ortho, orthopedics, to walk straight. And there had been a deviation. And it could be a very small deviation at first, but you keep walking down that road, that small deviation, and down the road it's 10 miles away. And Paul recognizes it. And he recognizes the role of tradition in it. Maybe he recognized it more than anybody else because he had been such a high-ranking Pharisee that he could smell it more than a fisherman could who could smell other things better than Paul could. And so what, he, what happens? He publicly stands up to Peter. And he points out that we know in verse 16 that we know that a man is not justified by works of law. But by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, nor that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by works of law, because by works of law shall no flesh be justified. And of course today, everybody goes, oh, that's just works of the Mosaic law. As if that's some low little thing, it's some irrelevant little thing, and, and now we can have a different law and we can, have, uh, we can have the laws that uh, encompass the sacraments of Rome or whatever group you come up with. You come up with your own law and just call it the law of Christ, etc., etc., etc. And that's how you get around these things. Or you say that these, this law here is just simply those boundary markers, the things that made Jews Jews. And all Paul is saying is you don't have to come a Jew first, but that leaves the door open for all sorts of other things that you can add in. And none of that makes any sense. Because notice what he says. He not only says that he has died to the law, that he might live to God, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but the life that I live, but Christ lives in me. And now the life which I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, the one who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside or put aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by law, Christ died needlessly unto emptiness. His whole point is this. If there was a means by which we, through obedience to law, could be made perfectly right before God, then the radical solution of the cross was absolute foolishness. Why should the Son come and give Himself if there was any other means that could have been utilized to bring us back into a right relationship with God? And so if you want the real answer to works salvation systems, it starts with the radical nature of the cross. I can guarantee you, someone in a work salvation system will not have a biblical theology of the atonement. They can't. 
They cannot really understand the incarnation. They cannot really understand the self-giving. They cannot really understand the fact that, that according to the book of Hebrews, he, that is Jesus, is able to save to the uttermost because, why? He ever lives to make intercession for them. Not because they have enough time to do all the right works they need to do to avail themselves of salvation and get themselves saved. And so the ultimate refutation of any work salvation system is going to be focused upon the sufficiency and the centrality of the cross of Jesus Christ. Who died? Why did he die? What did he accomplish? That is going to be the very essence of what you give to a person in response to their ideas that, well, I've done this, I've done that, I've, I'm, still, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, but I, I, I think you have to do this type of thing and that type of thing. That is going to be the first thing you want to focus upon. And let me just mention, just in passing, I, I've always loved the fact that that, uh, that aorist participle in verse 20, who loved me, the one who loved me, that's an aorist participle. It's referring to a particular point in time. And when, when was the love of Christ proven for every one of his people? On the cross. A historical reality. Ours is a faith that took place in history. It's not like the mythologies of the religions of that day where everybody knew these things didn't really happen. Ours is a faith that looks to the very center point of history at a spot outside of Jerusalem, midway through the fourth decade of the first century, when certain people sat upon the throne in Rome, certain people had the rulership there in Jerusalem, and a certain man gave his life. It's not a mythology. It's not just a story to make us feel good. It actually took place in time. And that's when Christ proved, the Son of God proved his love for me and gave himself in my behalf. His was not an atonement that made us savable. It was an atonement that saved and it was personal. I don't know how so many people who deny the specific saving nature and personal nature of the atoning work of Jesus Christ ever sing that hymn that talks about my name was written on his hand. Because if you think Jesus died for a class and then it's up to us to fill that up, what name was on his hand? Oh, well, he knew. Well, how do you know? That raises a whole other issue we can't even get into today. But please notice, if righteousness can come by any other means than faith in Jesus Christ, you are emptying the cross of all of its meaning. Christ died needlessly. Now, how well do you think that went over in the churches in Galatia on that Sunday morning when this letter was first read? You think they had a potluck that afternoon? You think anybody even had an appetite left? Probably not. Probably not. But like I said, those weren't the hardest words. Those weren't the hardest words. Turn with me to chapter 5. Chapter 5. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Same freedom that we just say, very same term that we saw back in chapter 2, where the false brethren are sneaking in to spy out the freedom which we have in Christ Jesus. What is that freedom? Well, I would suggest to you in the context of this epistle, it is the freedom of the sons of God who by faith have been made righteous before God in His righteousness imputed to them, and therefore they are free from all of the divisions that had once divided Jew and Gentile. They recognize they are one body in Christ. And they are free from all the requirements of men where men would try to say, you must do this, you must do this, you must do this, because they recognize that Christ has done it all. They look to Him and to Him alone. This is not a freedom that is libertinism. 
And that's normally where anyone who's promoting a self, uh, a self or a works righteousness system, they're going to go to all those texts and talk about doing good works. But freedom is not freedom from doing good works. It's freedom to do good works. There's a vast difference between being free to do good works out of love for God and the bondage that comes from thinking that by doing good works, I am earning my relationship with God. It's all the difference in the world. Nowhere do you get the idea that what Paul is saying is that by being set free in Christ, that we have forgotten that God's law reveals to us what is pleasing in his sight. Paul hadn't forgotten Jeremiah chapter 31. I will write my law upon their hearts. What does that mean? That our obedience comes from the heart now. When, it's not, when, when you have a heart of stone in an individual and you put them under the, the yoke of the law, what's going to be the result? Are they going to feel free? No, that law is going to chafe upon them and, and they are not going to want to do the things in the law. And even when they do, they don't do so from a heart that loves God. Didn't we have something called the Old Testament that illustrated that over and over and over again with the people of Israel? Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not be again subject to a yoke of slavery or servitude. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you are circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Now, what does this tell us? That these are people who are claiming to be Christians. They want to be in the Christian church. They are claiming benefit from Christ. And Paul says, no. If you start walking down that path, I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that you are a debtor to keep the whole, or to do the whole law. You see, the whole point here is, you have the way of law, and you have the way of grace. And they are 180 degrees opposite from one another. You can't get very far down both paths. If you're going to try to wed them together, as Paul says in Romans chapter 11, if you try to join works to grace, it's no longer grace because it's no longer free. Notice what he says. You have been severed from Christ. Whichever of you, how many ever of you, are seeking to be justified by means of law, you have fallen from katatos, grace. Now, I remember very clearly my senior year in, uh, in uh, high school. I see a bunch of books down here. Are these the, uh, the free gift for the speakers? I, I'm got it. Cool. What have we got down here? Oh, we've got uh, Apollo Gia Radio right there, right there. I just thought I'd mention that will leave it right there. So. Some other cool stuff down there. I'll just have to take that with me when I'm done. I was in my senior year in high school at a Southern Baptist church, a large Southern Baptist church in Phoenix. And one Sunday morning, my Sunday school teacher took us here to Galatians chapter 5. And he started talking about these verses. It didn't take me long to realize what he was saying. He and his wife, both Sunday school teachers in the senior high department, had decided that today was the day that they were going to help us to come to understand that salvation is not a permanent possession of God's people. You can lose it. And that we were in danger of losing it if we did not accept their message. And in all my years in Sunday school, this is the only time, after making sure that's what they were saying, that I got up and walked out. I had never done that. I was raised to be a good little boy, but I also realized when somebody was teaching something opposite of what was believed by the church. And this was the text that they went to. And they are strong words. They are strong words. But one thing they sort of forgot to mention 
was that little phrase in the middle of verse 4, as many of you as are seeking to be justified by law. If you are seeking your righteousness in any other place and by any other means, then to be found in the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, you're lost. How else can we interpret these words? What does it mean to be severed from Christ? Well, see, that, was one, that means you were once in Christ. And you've fallen for grace, that means you're once in grace, and so you can... But all those people who use this text never, never, never use it in its context, and that is of people who are seeking to be made right before God by keeping law. They always say, well, it's because of certain grievous sins you can commit or anything. Has, that's not what Paul's talking about. And his point is this, you can claim Christ all you want, but Christ is over there on the road of grace. He is not over there on the road of law. And if you, if you follow that road, he's going that way, you've gone that way. You're severed from him. The sphere of grace is over here. You're going this direction. You have completely missed the whole point. When you misdefine the purpose of the law, remember Romans chapter 3? When Paul says that a man is justified by faith apart from deeds of the law, the very next thing he says is, therefore, do we, are we casting the law away? Are we a bunch of antinomians? No, we establish the law. And Paul had already discussed this in, in Galatians earlier when he described the law as our, as our tutor, our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, because it displays God's perfect justice, because it explains to us what God's perfect standard is. It shows us what we are. And when it shows us what we are, it tells us what we need. We need one who can give us perfect righteousness between, before a perfectly holy God. Now those are really strong words. Cut off. Fallen. And yet he had to say them. Why? He had to say them because of what he said back in chapter 2. So that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. Now if you're dealing with individuals who have been raised within a religious system that communicates to them the idea that having done certain works, having undergone certain religious ceremonies, that this gives them a standing with God. How do you approach them? Well, first, you must understand, what is your standing with God? How is it that you have not been severed from Christ? What does it mean to, be not, to not fall from grace? You need to understand, and that's why the topic of my final presentation tomorrow logically goes before this one, but you need to understand that great exchange that has taken place. He made him who knew no sin to be sin in our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so that's why I said one of the primary things that you focus upon with anyone, it doesn't matter where they're coming from, is who Christ is, what his purpose in his self-giving was, and the fact that he is our all in all, that we focus solely upon him, that we have, we have no, no boasting that we can have except in the perfect work of Jesus Christ. The other direction that you need to go in dealing with someone like this is to a biblical anthropology. A biblical anthropology just simply means telling people who they are according to the Bible. And when you look at what we talked about when I spoke yesterday morning, Romans chapter 8, not able to do anything that is pleasing to God, not capable of doing so. When you communicate to someone the biblical truth of their deadness in sin, 
And I think the only way to do that, by the way, you can, you can use all the biblical language you want, but if they do not have a biblical understanding of who God is, all those words aren't going to make any meaning, they're not going to have any meaning to them. I think of Isaiah, and I think of his experience of God in Isaiah chapter 6, and, and he says, I am undone, I'm a man of unclean lips, I live amongst the people of unclean lips. He saw who he was, one of the holiest men of Israel, only when he saw himself in the light of who God was. And that's why for years, for example, one of the major groups that most definitely has a works salvation mentality are the Mormons. I've talked to some of those young elders, all of 19 years of age, of course, I was 19 when I first witnessed my first two missionaries, and so we were, we were uh, uh, contemporaries. Now they look like they're 12. Don't they, Jeff? They look like they're 12, don't they? You were 12 when I first met you. So, um, But um, I look at these young elders, and some of them, oh, wow, they have the Melchizedek priesthood, you know, and they're pretty hot stuff. And given what they believe, I have often said, you can talk about all the works righteousness passages, you can quote Galatians 2.16 and 2.20 and, and uh, Romans 3.28, and there's all sorts of verses you can go to, but as long as the person you're talking to still thinks that God's an exalted man from another planet and he can become a God someday, he doesn't have a God big enough to understand what the Bible actually teaches about salvation. So you've got to communicate to that person who God is first. In the same way, if I was going to show a clip of anything, I would have shown a clip of this. I had an amazing opportunity. I don't know how much time, but I had an amazing opportunity. Uh, October of 2013, I stood in the Abu Bakr Siddiq Mosque in Erasmia, South Africa. And as far as we know, that was the first time ever in South Africa that a Christian stood in a mosque to proclaim the gospel. I was in my stocking feet because you don't wear shoes in a mosque. It's always, always an odd thing. And the subject that night was sin and salvation. So picture this if you can. Some of you, how many of you have seen the debate? Okay. You may remember when the camera pans around. And what you see as I'm speaking about my unworthiness to even proclaim the gospel and my dependence upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ and, and, and Christ's fulfillment of the law, you see this entire room filled with Muslims seated upon the floor because there aren't any pews. You don't have chairs. The only chairs they brought in were for the wimpy Christians who couldn't sit on the floor for two and a half hours. And here are all of these Muslims sitting here listening to something they've never heard before in their life. What an amazing thing. And it was, it was absolutely purposeful on my part that I spoke to them of my utter unworthiness to even handle the gospel. That I am not saying that I am better than they are. That we are all alike sinners. And the standard of God, he's not simply going to wink at sin. That law represents who he is, and he's not going to simply go, oh, well, it's okay. There needs to be a sacrifice. There needs to be atonement. There needs to be a healing of the relationship, and that's what the whole message of Jesus Christ is. And by joining with them and saying, I, like you, am unworthy of this message, I was speaking to the fact that they have a works righteousness mentality as well because they don't believe in original sin. They don't believe we fell in Adam. And they don't believe there's a need for atonement. And so you see all these groups, when you're talking to the Roman Catholic, it doesn't matter whether they're nominal or active. Even if it's been years and years since their last confession, if they were raised in it, it has, it has entered their system through their pores. That there is something that you can do, something you must do to earn something from God. All those penances, even if they never did them, they heard their parents talk about them. And so whoever it is you're talking to, you have to keep in mind that this is where they're coming from, and therefore your presentation 
has to seek to be extremely consistent in the language you're using. And what you've always got to be thinking about is, how will this person reinterpret my words within their context? And if they're in danger of being reinterpreted, clarify. Make it even clearer that there is nothing that I can do. It's all of Christ. And I can't think of a better place than Galatians 5, Galatians 2, to take someone to. But you see, when you can explain the context to them, bring them into that historical reality. Ask them what would have been like to have been sitting in the congregation that day when this letter was written. These are things that these folks have probably never even thought of before. And so to make it real to them that way is simply to open the door for the Spirit of God to bring true conviction of sin. That's all you're trying to do. I hope you never try to convince somebody, argue somebody into the kingdom of God. Because if I can argue somebody in, somebody smarter than me can come along and argue them right back out again. I don't want converts. I want Christians that have been made Christians by the Spirit of God. Amen. And so I don't want my mechanisms to get in the way. So what am I saying? My time is up. What am I saying? We need to know what we believe so clearly, so forcefully, so biblically, that as soon as we hear any variation from that in the person we're speaking to, that we can communicate to them, not with our highfalutin theological words, we need to know them, but in the language that they can understand, recognize where they're going even before they get there, and emphasize the absolute freedom, sovereignty, and power of God's grace, and warn them, if you try to add anything to the grace of God, you are cutting yourself off from that grace. You are saying that Christ is not enough. And that's an incredibly dangerous thing to do. Let's pray together. Our merciful and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you this hour as debtors to grace. And Lord, we would pray that no matter what the context we're in, no matter where we are proclaiming your truth, may we always do so as individuals who know our absolute dependence upon grace. May our words always communicate the perfection of your work, the perfection of your ways. May we always be pointing away from ourselves and to our Savior and his perfect work. And as we have opportunity to speak to those who've been deceived by false teaching, who've been given a false hope, Lord, we would pray that as we bring the word of God to bear, Lord, that by your spirit, you would honor that word and you would draw your people to yourself. Use us as instruments in your hand. We know that as long as we speak your truth, you are glorified therein. Lord, we thank you for this time of preparation, this time of fellowship, this time of encouragement. May you continue to guide and direct and to bless as we continue to look into your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.